Thank you. Hello and welcome to Talks at Columbia. My name is Dr. Jason Wingard. I am the Dean and Professor of the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. Thank you all for being here and welcome again. Columbia University and the School of Professional Studies are tied at the hip. The School of Professional Studies is one of 20 prestigious schools here at Columbia University. And SPS exists to advance knowledge with purpose, to move careers, to move communities, and to move industries. We prepare learners from all backgrounds, whether they're right out of college, whether they're industry practitioners, or whether they're senior executives, to learn for life. Talks at Columbia is a thought leadership series that features Columbia faculty as well as industry practitioners and executives across sectors from around the world. Together they discuss cutting edge topics that are rapidly changing the professional nature of the world and society at large. We started Talks at Columbia several years ago at the School of Professional Studies because we have seen that our graduates are graduating into an ever-evolving global marketplace. It's changing quickly and it demands dynamic skills and continued flexibility to succeed. Our focus at SPS is to respond to those shifts and to help our students, again, learn for life. Our bioethics program is a perfect reflection of our mission at SPS. Bioethics is a subject area of increasing importance globally. The actions of medical and health professionals can have many implications infecting and affecting large swaths of populations around the world and for entire nations. Today's program on the science and ethics of market wellness will feature a discussion between Dr. Chelsea Clinton and Dr. Randy Hutter Sutton of Columbia University. Before we open the talk, I would like to introduce our academic director of the bioethics master's program and a distinguished uh, Columbia faculty member, Dr. Robert Klisman. Bob. Thank you, Jason. Well, thank you very much, Dean Wingard, and thank, uh, thank you all for coming this evening. We also have about 200 people online all over the world live streaming this event, uh, and we welcome you who are online as well, and we encourage you to ask questions during the question and answer period uh, that'll follow the conversation that uh, Chelsea and Randy are gonna have. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Randy Epstein and Dr. Chelsea Clinton. Please come on stage. Randy is a physician, journalist, and friend whom I've known since medical school at Yale. She received both a master's in journalism and a master's of public health from here at Columbia, and she's written outstanding journalism for the New York Times and many other publications, as well as two terrific books, Get, uh, Get Me Out, A History of Childbirth from the Garden of Eden to the Sperm Bank. It's a wonderful book. And most recently, a basis for tonight's conversation, Aroused, the history of hormones and how they control just about everything. I'm also honored to introduce Chelsea Clinton. She received a doctorate in international relations from Oxford and a master's degree in public health from here at Columbia. She too has authored several books and is currently vice chair of the Clinton Foundation, advancing global health, service, and economic opportunity all over the world. She is the daughter, of course, of the 42nd President of the United States, Bill Clinton, and of the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, elected by a majority of popular votes as our 45th <laughs> President. <laughs> Randy and Chelsea will be having a conversation and will then have time for questions and answers, after which Randy will be selling and signing copies of her book over here. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, oh good. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Uh, Jason, thank you for welcoming us so warmly here uh, to the Lowe Memorial Library. I wanna thank everyone who made tonight possible. Uh, I know events like this are always the product of a tremendous amount of teamwork, so thank you uh, to everyone at Talks uh, Columbia, everyone kind of from the bioethics program, uh, and anyone else who kind of put in your time to enable us to have uh, what I suspect will be uh, a really uh, interesting conversation, hopefully not just for Randy and me, but really for all of you. 
Uh, it is such a joy to be here with someone that I uh, admire and love as much as Randy and truly from whom I always learn something. And this is just a terrific book. So I hope that if you have not already got a copy, that you certainly will after our conversation this evening. Um, and I will shamelessly exploit my time uh, on stage with Randy to ask her questions, uh, but also hope that you're thinking about your own questions so that when we move to that part of the program, uh, we can get to as many of you as possible. Uh, so Randy, I thought we'd start uh, this evening um, by just kind of listening to you reflect on why you wanted to write this book right now. I wanted to delve into hormones and the history of hormones, I think for two reasons. One is because I think we all sort of talk about, oh, we're hormonal, what does it mean? We think it's this vague notion, but they actually are these potent scientific chemicals. Where did we come up with this theory? So there was that scientific reason to sort of explain things, but I also think that now, and if we go back in history, Hormones are these things where we think, oh, we're gonna be able to live longer, we're gonna have a better sex life, we're going to be able to relate to people more, is there a quick cure? So to me, the subject is hormones, but it's much bigger in the sense of, what are we grasping for when we're buying these things? And what are the doctors telling us? And looking at the whole issues of certainty and uncertainty. You know, my doctor said he's not sure, so it's so much easier to go to someone else who says this hormone will make you do that. So I was trying to write sort of the book that wasn't you're gonna live forever book, but the book that's like, I hope these are great stories that will really help you understand what hormones are doing, what you may need, um, and then how to avoid some of the wacky stuff that's out there then and now. And one of the things I think Randy does so brilliantly is to share such compelling stories that help animate every chapter in each discrete discussion of hormones. And uh, there are just so many um, kind of painful and inspiring anecdotes that you share. Painful anecdotes of people who were exploited for their hormonal abnormalities, either uh, for profit or kind of uh, misguided and sometimes malfeasant science, I would say, but also incredible stories of parents who really go above and beyond to try to ensure that their children have access to kind of whatever science thinks is the right answer right now. But one of the stories that really struck me um, that you and I have talked a lot about, and I am no less struck the more we talk about it, are all of the men who got vasectomies because they believed it would help you know, increase their testosterone, make them more virile, and help them live longer. And quite notably, in one instance, the opposite happened. So can you just share that story and also how it helps illuminate kind of how complex and challenging um, even often well-meaning people kind of are in what they think the science of hormones is? Sure. I mean, I love the story also because sometimes I think we're thinking, God, 2019, why are people believing this? What's wrong with our society? But go back to 1920, and that was pretty wacky time too. So it's maybe it's just the way we are as people. We want a quick fix. But the reason why I like this story, and yes, it was this big fad in the 1920s. Men were lining up. Maybe they weren't lining up, but they were going one by one individually in their privacy of their own doctor's room. To get a At least we hope they were we going they were. They were in privacy. Um, but they were getting vasectomies because it was touted that it would boost their libido. Spoiler alert, it doesn't, so s just stay for the rest of the talk. But um, <laughs> the reason why I like the study is we have in medicine, like we always know they're like your well-meaning doctors and then they're your charlatans. But there's also this big gray zone of people that do good things, but they kind of made a mistake or they just, you know, even great scientists, they take a leap of faith. And then we say, wow, that was brilliant. But that brilliance was a leap of faith. And sometimes people take that leap of faith and they kind of jump the wrong way. So Eugene Steinach was this absolutely brilliant scientist in the 1920s in Vienna. And he was so brilliant, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize 11 times. Not for the vasectomy libido thing, but for actually finding the cell in the body that spews male hormone. Now we know it's testosterone, at the time it wasn't named. So he did some really good work. The only reason why he didn't get the Nobel was the Nobel Committee did not believe that that cell spews hormones. So the Nobel Committee was wrong, but regardless, brilliant man, nominated for the Nobel 11 times, 
And then he started getting very interested in like libido and male hormone. He, he had a hunch, this is where he started to go a little wrong, that male hormone meant everything manly, which to Steinek in the 1920s, he thought that meant thinking well, enterprising, um, thinking clearly, strong libido, strong male, everything that he thought men were. So then he thought, as he was doing these experiments, if we could just block in some of this male hormone, whatever it is, and not have it go out, then we would just make men smarter and more libidinous and more whatever all that male stuff is. So he did an experiment on a rat, a male rat, and gave the male rat a vasectomy. And I'm sort of jumping over a little of the science, but basically he thought, oh wow, this worked. He thought his male rat looked more eroticized. That's the word he used. I know it's not a real word, he used that word. I'm not exactly sure how he rated his, how he rated rat eroticism, <laughs> but maybe there's an expert in the audience and you can tell us after. So he did one or two experiments on rats, so it wasn't just a trend. And then he told a, a friend of his who was a doctor, Steinek was a doctor, but he only did research. So he told a surgeon friend, I want you to give a vasectomy to a man and ask him if it, you know, and tell him it might boost his libido and see what happens. One thing led to another, and they were telling men, we're gonna do a vasectomy. And we think this is gonna make you think more clearly. We think this is gonna you know, boost your libido. 100% of men said it worked. I mean, that's amazing, you know, if you base science on testimonials. Freud was Steinacked. Actually, it became so common that it became a verb. You were Steinacked. You weren't just like getting a vasectomy for libido, you got Steinacked. Freud got Steinacked. Yeats, the poet, got Steinacked. And then, of course, it just took off in America because back in the 1920s, this is gonna be hard to believe, but stay with me for a minute on this. Back in the 1920s, sometimes people believed in what their friends and testimonials said over what their doctors were telling them. It's shocking, but we've gotten smarter. So there were doctors in the 1920s saying, doesn't really make sense, but men were lining up for this. But Chelsea loves the story of Alfred Wilson. That's what, that's what you wanted. Yes. You like this, this punchline. I know, it's terrible. Please don't think I'm such a macabre person when she gets to the end no, of the story. No, just the guy dies. Oh, okay, that's the punchline. <laughs> so there's this guy, Alfred Wilson, that got Steinacked. He was in his 70s and he thought, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I want to share this with the world. So he rented out the Royal Albert Hall. If any of you have been in London, the Beatles performed there in the 1960s. This was 1918. But already it was like a big fancy place. He rented it out and he was, I think the title, it's in my book, it was something like, you know, how I revived myself. And he was going to talk about that he wasn't thinking clearly. He was slow. He had no libido. He got a vasectomy. And now look at me. I'm like a 20-year-old man. Except your favorite part, he dropped dead of a heart attack the night before he was supposed to go on. Um, Steinek came right out and said, not my fault, has nothing to do with the vasectomy, but it did put a little, it did put a little skepticism into the value of having the vasectomy. And, it, and well, one of the reasons I like the story, not only for its dramatic punchline, um, is that it did inject a bit of skepticism in a healthy sense, so at least people were questioning kind of the eternal value of being Steinacked. You know, but Randy, I want to um, kind of go back to something you said, like we're so much smarter now in 2019 than we were in, you know, a, a century ago. I know it was a joke. Um, <laughs> but I, I am curious, and you and I have, have talked a lot about this, like why do you think in in health, medicine, wellness, kind of the, the broader category of how we kind of think about ourselves today and what's possible kind of for ourselves in the future. Um, why are we so vulnerable to either kind of the well-meaning gray area where we don't really know enough to have certainty or actually to medical hoaxes? Why do you think kind of in medicine and health we're particularly willing to suspend critical thinking, to trust our friends, to trust testimonials over kind of what current science is telling us? Well, I think it hits on two things. One, from the scientist's perspective, and there's probably scientists in the audience, um, and so scientists know this. Scientists is, is, oh, science is always evolving knowledge. 
and you learn this right away in medical school or when you're getting your PhD. This is what we think we know now. We're never 100% sure. And your doctor's never going to say to you, I know this is going to work. Be on this diet. Take this pill. This is the issue. And that uncertainty that is inevitable in science and medicine can be very um, unnerving for patients. And then easily exploited. And easily exploited. So as you know, I like to say this, and I know this makes you cringe, but if you want to be a good charlatan, if you want to make a lot of money easily, here's what you do. You provide people with certainty. I mean, you, and you only work nine to five. You don't take call, that you do. But you, you provide people with a certainty. You tell them, stay on this diet. I am sure you're gonna feel better. And I'm all for the placebo effect, as long as it doesn't cost you a lot of money and it doesn't have a lot of dangerous side effects. But there are people out there, and I've spoken to them in the process of doing my book, that will tell people things, that will sell things and say, there's no side effects. Life has a side effect. I mean, that's, you know, someone said to me, how do you know if, like, someone's a charlatan or how do you know? I think someone says there's no side effects, then that's, that's a red flag. Like, that's not a good thing. But so I think that's from the doctors and the scientists' point of view. Of the, It's very hard to express uncertainty. It's very hard to explain to patients I'm doing the best I can with the knowledge we have now, which might change in a few years. And then I think from, we're all patients, from that perspective, from our perspective, when you're not feeling right, it's so easy when you're feeling healthy to poke fun of other people for grasping at things, but when you're not feeling right, even if you're not in dire pain, but you're just feeling too tired all the time or too foggy, you start to feel desperate. And if someone says to you, look, I'm a little on the vanguard, try this, just try it. Like, I think it's very easy if it costs a little bit, if it might have a side effect. We just want to feel better. We want to feel our best. And I think we live in this society now where it's very, we want to be on top of our game all the time. And if you're not on top of your game and you're feeling like you're sliding and someone's going to offer you a quick fix, it's so hard to say no to that. Well, and one of the things I think um, you really draw out with compassion um, is not only why patients sometimes kind of not only feel that way, but then make decisions from the basis of feeling, um, but also why doctors sometimes do as well, you know, and trying to provide more certainty or an answer, um, even if there isn't a real evidence base. Um, and yet sometimes it proves that those hypotheses were correct. Like I think about the anecdotes around human growth hormone. Um, and yet, even that clearly had often deeply painful, unintended consequences. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how um, sometimes, you know, the kind of well-meaning leaps of faith actually do lead to innovation, not always without challenge. And, and that can be hopefully a good complement to the Steinach anecdote. Oh, sure. Okay, so some good things that we've done. Um, one of the stories that I like to tell, I mean, it, it, it's not, it's so much not actually a hormone, but measuring hormones. And I love this story because it's a New York story. And this is a woman who made a great leap of faith in science, although science kind of tried to keep her out for a while. Um, and it's not actually a story we talk about a lot, so I'm just going to bring it up now. Um, but up until really the 1960s, endocrinology and hormone work was really guesswork. If you went to your doctor because you thought you were lacking a hormone or you thought your kid was too short, they kind of did x-rays, they kind of maybe took some blood tests of varying things, but they couldn't measure hormones. So we're not talking that long ago. Kids born in 1960 or, or in the 1950s, there was all these other kind of measurements, but you couldn't measure hormones. I mean, think about it. You know, like now we have the fertility business. Now with measuring hormones. Now we have all these things you go in and you can know your exact level and how it's changing. But this wonderful event that happened is this, these two, this, um, I was about to say a couple, but they were a couple at work, not a husband and wife team, Rosalind Yallow and Solomon Burson. They were working in New York City. I like Rosalind Yallow's story. I go into it more in the book, but I'll just tell you quickly. She was a poor Jewish girl from New York, graduated from Hunter. She was tops in her class in physics, and she said, this is what I want to do. I love science. She didn't know she was going to get a Nobel at the time. She just wanted to learn. And her teachers said, 
Roslyn, this is the 1940s, or maybe they didn't say that, but they did say this. Don't you think it would be more appropriate to become a secretary to a scientist? So she had no choice. It was 1940s. So she got a job for a scientist at here at Columbia University because she wanted to take science courses here at Columbia. And her boss said, don't you think stenography would make more sense? So she eventually did get, a, she did get into graduate school. She got a PhD. Um, her kids have said to me, my mom has no sense of humor. I think from what I've read about her, she had a little sense of humor because she did say they had to have a world war just so I could get a PhD. So she did get into, she, Purdue University called Hunter and said, we have two spots. It's World War II. We can't fill up these programs. Um, she's Jewish. She's a woman. Will you guarantee that you'll give her a job back at Hunter? Because that's where she went to college after her PhD, and Hunter said, we can't guarantee, so they rescinded that. Um, then University of Illinois did accept her in reluctantly. She got a PhD, um, met her husband, another a New York City guy. She met him out there at University of Illinois. She got her PhD a year before him. He got his job offer first figure that out. Um, she eventually got a job in the Bronx in the VA and in this tiny little lab, which according to lore, I'm not sure it's true, but I still like the story, um, they gave her a janitor's closet for a lab. But in that lab, she and Solomon Burson figured out this technique which I think I describe well in the book, but I'm not getting into science here. A scientist will note his radioimmunoassay, and we still base things on that. But she figured out how to measure hormones. She published the data, sent it in. It was rejected across the board because basically editors who are just human, flawed human beings were like, no, you can't measure hormones. It's impossible. She was livid. She's like, look at the data. We figured out how to measure hormones because hormones are so sparse in the body. It's like measuring like a teardrop in the ocean. Eventually, she got the piece published. Then um, people, she knew the she knew this was huge. She knew this could be used to measure drug doses, all things, not just hormones. She knew she was revolutionizing 20th century medicine. Um, and someone said, "You got to get a patent right away." And she said, "Absolutely not. Like this is so revolutionary. Everyone should be able to do this." So she didn't make a penny on this. Um, and all of a sudden, people were flocking to the VA to learn this technique, and it really did it. It changed dramatically, not just endocrinology. We wouldn't have the fertility business. We wouldn't be able to detect like HIV in blood. We wouldn't be able to do drug dosing. So I think she took a leap of faith in doing this, and she not only took a leap, but she had to like push people in her way in order to get this done. And in her very last talk, which was to a group of public school students in third grade in New York City, she said to them, stick to the data, stick to the facts, and when you know you're right, save all your rejection letters because you can use them as part of your exhibit when you get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> um, I love that story. <laughs> and you're right, we should talk about it more. Um, you know, since we've been in the early 20th century, we've been in the mid 20th century. I just want to give you a chance, Randy, um, particularly before we open it up to questions. I think this may help spur uh, questions in the audience, kind of to talk about hormone science today, and kind of where you really do see both innovation on the positive side, and also kind of what are the hoaxes and the kind of areas of greatest profit for charlatans that really worry you. Okay. And I'm going to answer this question, then I have a question for you. So if you're like, oh, yay, we'll get to your Chelsea season. Um, so today, I think on the positive note, what we're really getting into is looking at hormones and behavior. We're not there yet. Okay, we know that certain times we might feel more lousy certain times of the month. We know we feel different whether we're pregnant or menopausal, which we're sharing that on stage today. We thought we did that, yeah, and um, menopausal. Um, so... Um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, but I think where we are today is um, looking at hormones and behavior. And we're there, we're, we're learning things like, one of, one of the last chapters I have is on hormones and hunger and obesity. And the reason I put it last wasn't just because whatever, hormones and obesity, I don't know, I put the fat chapter last. But it was also because to me, that's the forefront, and a lot of the research is also being done here at Columbia. We have some leading researchers in leptin and ghrelin and these hormones, because it's not just about metabolism, it's about drives, like what is driving you to eat? What is driving your hunger? What is driving your appetite? 
and that also shows people like these links between hormones and hunger, hormones and mood, hormone and mood swings. We're getting there, we're not there yet. There is some wonderful research going on. I talk about oxytocin, and this goes into both the good and the bad. There's some fascinating research also here at Columbia. Um, there's a wonderful scientist um, who's working on oxytocin. We're getting clues, this is the hormone that we know squeezes the uterus to get the baby out. It's also the hormone that gets your milk going when you're breastfeeding. But we also know that it has something to do with mother-baby bonding in rats and infants. And we also think from research going on now, it has something to do with social cues in humans. So something about this, something in the temporal lobe. That's why they think like mothers hearing a baby cry, there is this like flood of oxytocin and certain maternal things then happen. So there's really interesting things going on in oxytocin. There's also really wacky stuff going on in oxytocin. So I think that shows sort of the good and the bad. So you can actually go online, but not now, um, and you can go on Amazon and spend $48 and get like a spray of oxytocin. It could just be water, but even if it is oxytocin, they claim if you spray it around, like you're gonna get the guy in the bar next to you, you know, and the sitting at the bar is gonna like fall in love with you just the way like your baby's cry makes you wanna hug your baby. So there's, you know, it sounds like something from the 1920s, but this is 2019. So I think, so that's what sort of excites me now. And I think um, this is gonna be like an awkward segue, but I think what keeps us both up at night, cause sometimes like I'll email Chelsea like late at night and be like, Oh my God, did you see this article? Because it just drives me crazy when I see some of the wacky stuff. And I know it drives you crazy, so then I, we have this bond over that. And, and I always figure if I email you late at night, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna wake you up. You'll just see it at your own leisure. But, um, but I wanna know, because we go back and forth with this stuff, like what does, I know you have an interest in healthcare, I know you have an interest in accurate medical communication, but what does keep you up and what do you think is still the one issue or maybe a few issues that, that still concern you when it comes to healthcare? Well, there's so many and kind of my answer varies based on uh, kind of country context, but just you know, here in the United States and one of the things that I think is underpinning so much of what Randy talks about in her book and also has been talking about here tonight um, is we do have just an absence of health literacy and scientific literacy and, and data literacy in our country. And so that I think even people who want to be able to navigate often complex, contradictory, challenging information from a variety of both, I would say, authoritative and not sources, don't even know how to distinguish which are authoritative and which are not, don't know how to kind of translate what they're reading into kind of their own lives or their family lives to make kind of the best data-based decisions for their health or the health of their families. And I think we see this so acutely right now in our um, debate over vaccines, um, which I do find very painful from a public health perspective, um, and also very just painful from a personal perspective, because I remember, as I've shared with Randy, I remember my grandmother, uh, my mom's mom, talking about how proud she was when her children got vaccinated. And she remembered like waiting for her kids to get vaccinated, you know, against polio, against smallpox, you know, something that the first hopefully we will eradicate in the near future and the last which we, you know, declared victory against in 1980. Um, and just the fact that like we are not only relitigating, but in some ways dismissing and denigrating not just the science, but the progress in public health, kind of for us to get to where we are, um, kind of in, in the world of vaccines is something I find you know, very upsetting. And yet I also find it encouraging that with the measles outbreaks around our country, including here in New York City, we do see vaccination rates rising. I mean, in Oregon and Washington, you know, we've had four, five, six times as many people getting vaccinated in the last couple months after the recent measles outbreak than in the kind of couple months preceding that. So I'm hopeful that now that these kind of, you know, deeply serious infectious disease threats are coming back, 
while I wish that kind of they hadn't needed to come back, it hopefully will spur people to action. And yet I still think we have these larger questions of how do we help equip people, not only in institutions like Columbia, but really at the elementary, middle school, high school level and other civic and public forums to be able to make not only what they feel are the right choices for themselves and their families, but what they know from an evidence and a data perspective are the right choices for themselves and their families, whether on something that I wish were really kind of quotidian like vaccines or something that is really evolving science, like everything that Randy talks about related to hormones. So, yeah. All right, let's take questions from the audience. Otherwise, I will just keep asking just questions. Um, I can't see very well, so forgive me for like covering my eyes. Um, don't all raise your hands at once. Um, there's a mic. You also can just get up and shout if you kind of feel like you have adequate lung capacity and can project. Um, we won't be offended. Goodness. Yes, sir, with, with the hand up. And there's only one hand up, so you know who you are. And please tell us your name. So many different outcomes that we know, whether it's nutrition, whether it's mental health, different things do work for different people and it varies across all these different modalities. If someone is intending to do good and the outcome isn't positive because, for instance, it worked for them or their mother, their father, or what have you, how do you try to think about that space? Because it's a very, it's a hard space and you want people to really step into it and try to help the world, but at the same time, if they're going to be then looked at as maybe not experts or people that have the ability to help, it may push them away or you know, not give them an opportunity to help if they do have information or intuition or things that you know, span all these modalities, which again, no one really has the right answer at the end of the day. I think that's such an important question and yeah. one I know Randy thought a lot about, like how do people weigh personal testimonials that aren't just something that they like watch on YouTube or, or pull down from a Facebook group, but actually are there their family, their friends, sharing with them, how do they think about that, like in making healthcare choices, particularly as it relates to hormones? Yeah, and I think you're also talking about, then also from the doctor's perspective, like how do you, if, you, if you're if you a caregiver and you have a hunch, and but then you might be wrong, and how does that, I mean, I think, to me it all boils down to doctor-patient or healthcare provider-patient communication. And I do think that if you're going to an endocrinologist or somebody that's an expert in that field, I really think it does boil down to, there are things that go on in the doctor-patient room that when people know their, their patients so well, I think if it's elaborated in a way that said, look, this, here's something new, and here's the data. I mean, there's always data on something. It could be, we only know this from a small study so far. I've had five patients that have done well, or I've heard from a colleague, I can't guarantee, but I'm, all, I'm willing to help try and I'll monitor you throughout. You know, I, a lot of times I think it's the way it's presented, which is very different from saying, here's this new thing and I know it's gonna work. And I, so I think it gets down to doctors learning how to communicate in a positive way and communicate their uncertainty. And then it also comes down to people appreciating that sometimes someone's trying to do their best and sometimes the outcomes don't, you know, you, it's hard, it's so easy to blame somebody for trying something if it doesn't work out. And we all have to realize that's sort of the art of medicine. So I'm not sure that answered. Is that what you were getting at? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, with the notebook. Hi, my name is Tess um, and my question is for Chelsea. Um, I know that you're on the board of a company called Nurex, which um, sells birth control just um, by ordering it on a smartphone app, um, which is awesome. Um, and it looks like telemedicine is kind of becoming like the future of healthcare. Um, and so my question for you is, I'm wondering, how do you think about the risks involved in doctors prescribing drugs over the internet to patients that they haven't met? I think this is such an important question. Um, and let me be clear, I, wish, and I have said this publicly, um, I wish Nurex didn't exist um, because I do not believe that uh, women should have to rely on a private company to access birth control. Like I wish that this were a role that the government provided. 
uh, either directly through uh, insurance or other mechanisms. And yet, at a moment where reproductive rights are under assault in our country, uh, and it pains me um, that this is particularly true in my original home state of Arkansas, um, although not uniquely true in Arkansas, I think we do need other innovators to step into the breach. And one of the things I like about Nurex's model uh, is that it is doctors and nurse practitioners doing the prescribing, and if there are any questions, um, there still has to be an inpatient, face-to-face, -face, like doctor visit, which I think is a hugely important safety mechanism. Um, and yet because so many women are worried about being stigmatized for being on birth control, um, so many women who are even insured, and this is not only something we see at Nurex, it's something we see like in other um, companies engaged in similar work, many still choose to not file for reimbursement through their insurance companies, which also says to me this is still an area of tremendous stigma in our country, and it shouldn't be because women should be able to set whatever reproductive kind of health um, horizons and cadences we each determine are right for ourselves and we should be able to change our minds about that at different points throughout our life. So Nurex is still very heavily centered on doctor and nurse practitioner patient relationships um, and a significant portion of people actually still have to circle through uh, inpatient doctor visit. Uh, and yet this whole area of stigma isn't only kind of pervasive in birth control, it's also why Norex is engaged in PrEP and in trying to think about other areas of stigma as being real opportunities for trying to not only ensure people get the diagnoses and care they need, but also as a way to ameliorate stigma over time. And yet again, I wish Norex didn't exist. And yet I'm very grateful, particularly at this moment, that it does. Yeah. Uh -huh. Other questions? Yes. On this side of the room. Right here. I want yes. To, yeah, I want to balance the room a little bit, right? Yes, thank you. I'm cool. sorry. You're right. I should, I will shift. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Drashko Nakic. I actually just got my PhD from Colombia. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and I kind of work in this space, um, you know, um, and a peer-to-peer -peer communication, a patient peer-to-peer -peer co communication in online health communities. And so my question is, you know, uh, uh, these, these online health communities are, are places where patients with all sorts of medical conditions and problems come together to share their day-to-day -day experiences with the treatments that are prescribed by physicians and try to learn from each other. You know, like diabetes, self-management, cancer, things like that, chronic diseases, which treatment is kind of very tied to day-to-day -to -day, uh, experiences and like behaviors and socioeconomic backgrounds and everything. And so how much should that data that's generated in, in the discussions in those online health communities influence uh, how physicians look at, at, at certain patients based on the data they, that they have produced in those communities? Can that affect how they communicate uh, between each other, the patient and the physician. How do you have some some opinion on that? How do you see that? I mean, I think it's funny. I was just talking to a group of doctors about this last night because I wasn't that. I mean, I know I had known about a lot of these patient groups where you share information because, of course, you know, my doctor said this, and you want and you get tidbits from that. But I actually had never thought about it until last night, sort of from the doctor's perspective. And so I was listening to doctors talking about that, oh, like their patients, actually they were talking about it in the way that what they need to be aware of is, there was a psychiatrist talking about, I think, that there's some online groups for patients on lithium for bipolar that tell each other how to titrate it or how to use lower doses than the doctor's giving you. Um, same with diabetes and insulin. There are people that are, um, you know, teenagers just not taking the exact doses that their doctors want them to. So I was hearing from doctors saying, we need to know this. Like, we think we're talking to our patients, and then they are just like little soldiers and listening to us as the only person. And it was just last night, and they were saying, we, have to, we should be aware. Somehow we have to get into these communities without, without sort of interfering in that space. But I think it's important that doctors know. Um, 
yeah, data would be wonderful, but even before the data, just to get some sense. I think at, at this point right now, I think a lot of doctors don't even realize some of these conversations are going on. Um, so I think, it, I think it'd be fascinating research to have to do. But then again, also then it gets into the issue of privacy and who I think a lot of these people think they're sharing information privately, so I don't know. Other questions? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a question from uh, one of our live stream participants. Um, David Hoffman is asking, should, charlatan, should charlatans who are licensed clinicians be subject to professional discipline for promoting false medical claims? And I think he's specifically referencing the First Amendment, Amendment versus professional responsibility. Wow, before you brought up First Amendment, I had an answer and then it got legal and I thought, I don't know the legal things, but... <laughs> From a medical ethics point of view, without having, and you're the attorney some years, so maybe you can like um, stop me on this one, but with, from the medical ethics point of view, yeah, I do think, I think that doctors who we think are knowingly promoting something, that they're, that they're selling and making money off of something that is shown to have dangerous side effects, or giving false advice, this doesn't have side effects, or, um, yeah, I think we're slowly doing it. I think, you know, I actually tried during my book process, I was calling the Florida Department of Public Health. I thought I was on to something. I got the woman's cell number, and then, because I thought a doctor was over, you know, really in a horrible way overdosing or giving out too many doses of hormones in different ways. So when I finally got this woman on the phone, she was just like, you know, we're so overwhelmed. We have so many doctors here doing this. It's gonna take forever. Um, but no, I think that we need to be more stringent about this. And I do think, I think it's it's really hard because when someone has an MD, people assume that they're getting the right advice. I also think it sounds kind of awkward, but I do think that you need to know whether your doctor has financial ties into certain companies and will that sway sort of the advice that they're giving you. That's not so much charlatan that's sort of swaying, but I think with the charlatans, yes, I think we do need to be, um, I think there does need to be a crackdown so that, it's right now, consumers know it's out there. Consumers are savvy, and they know that there are charlatans out there. They know that there are doctors promoting things that they probably shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that patients have to do their own homework and analysis when they go to someone that has a shingle, that has a degree. It should be that you can just walk in to anyone that has a degree or that is selling or that is taking care of you and you don't have to do a Google search and you don't have to ask investigative savvy questions. So I do agree that I think we do need to be stricter and I'm not sure, I'm not sure how First Amendment gets into that because I guess you can say whatever you want but you can't have false medical claims. So. Yeah, and I, I think that is an important point. Um, there is a reason we have statutes around fraud, for example. Um, and I also think the real question should be put as well to the professional associations and to the board certifying you know, mechanisms. And are there other, in the best sense, pressure points beyond just the overwhelmed Department of Health in Florida? Um, and that's not to say they should abrogate their responsibility, but are there other places, you know, to try to have real accountability um, that may have more capacity uh, than the overwhelmed Florida Department of Health? I mean, we do have, I write about this in the book, there's something called the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and it sounds great. It's an Ameri It's a name, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. That's basically what it is. It's just a name. They are not accredited by, they're not recognized by the American board of that accredits any medical medical um, specialties. So if you're accredited by the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, it basically doesn't mean anything. I went to their meeting, I talked to a lot of people there. I ran after one man, a doctor, an MD, who was about to sit for a $3,000 test that he studied for, I guess, two days for, because that's what you have to do, you have to study for a whole two days. Um, and I went and I like I grabbed him right for I mean I, I didn't I actually just yelled to him and I said why are you taking this like why are you taking this like it doesn't mean anything it's not like you're a board certified endocrinologist you're going to be board certified from in hormones from the American Academy of Anti Aging Medicine and he said to me oh but they give you a diploma that I can put in my office and your patients don't know the difference that should be penalized that should not be allowed um, well, I agree right. clearly. <laughs> All right, other questions? Oh gosh, now we have so many hands. Yes. Oh, Kyle, hi. 
It's one of my students. I didn't even recognize him initially. Yes. Hi, so my name is Kyle McDonald. I'm an MD and I'm a student at uh, the Mailman School in my MPH. And so my question for you both has to do with credibility of messaging for clinicians. So I feel like one of our greatest strengths in the medical field is that we go to the data, we look to the data, and because of that, recommendations evolve. But our constantly evolving recommendations and that inconsistency can sometimes undermine our credibility with the public, especially today with such a data-driven world. So my question is, how can we as clinicians and scientists better explain rapidly evolving recommendations on a population level without undermining our credibility? We're both public health people, and I know it's really, I think, I think the one thing that's hard to communicate, but we need to keep trying, is that there's a big difference, as you know, you're, you're an MD and you're in the School of Public Health, there's a big difference between population studies and individuals. So, you know, 80% of people can do, show a drug works well on them, or will be healthier if they eat a certain way, but that doesn't mean the same as one-on-one. -on -one. How do we express that to people? I mean, I think we really have to try to convey to people that there's never gonna be one umbrella diet and one, one way to like go on this diet or this way of life and we're all different and we're all changing and what may work for you in your 20s may not work for you in your 50s. Um, and I do think, I mean, I, I, I hate to keep coming back to it, but it does get down to doctor-patient relationships. And it also, one of my medical professors said she always did this, and it was always a shock to her. She would always say to people after she was talking to them, um, can you just repeat back to me, just tell me, repeat back to me what you just, what you got from this. And she, I thought, she was like, this one from the Bronx, she like told it like it was. You know, she speaks so well. She said, like, most of the time, people, oh, I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> can you, what, what did you say? Um, so it was, it was incredible for her to realize how little, even when she did such a good job. But I think that's a start where people's fears are. But we have to, um, it's, it's, I think it gets back into doctor patient communication again. And people appreciating the uncertainty of medicine, which is really hard. I think it's a hard concept. Yeah, and also distinguishing between where we do have, relative certainty, like smoking is bad for you. Like vaccines are good. Vaccines are good for you, right? And I think being able to establish that, even if it requires real continued consistency of communication, and also um, being candid about where there's uncertainty. In some ways, like thinking about the earlier question around birth control, right? Like often birth control is, is trial and error for how it makes a woman feel, not just on like the efficacy, that's pretty well established, but will you have reactions? Will your breasts be tender? Will they grow? Like, will you feel groggy? Will you um, maybe have greater anxiety? You know, that could all happen on one pill and not on the other. And so I think, you know, it's a challenge for not only, you know, doctors, Kyle, but for any of us who care about public health to also just be candid about the degrees of certainty. Uh, and hopefully that helps to build a relationship of trust publicly and also um, with individual patients. And, and to be candid, like if we get things wrong, because like we all make mistakes. And hopefully that too ultimately helps build trust and not erode it. But I, I think the challenge is it is also cumulative and ongoing. And so you have to have trust and faith on both sides to be able to ensure that it's cumulative over time. Yeah, other questions? Oh gosh, now we have so many. Um, maybe, should we go back to this side of the room? Oh gosh, right there in the, in the red. Are you wearing red? I'm sorry that it's based on is like someone holding a notebook or what color you're wearing. <laughs> Well, thank you, this has been very interesting. Uh, my name is Megan Marks, I'm a graduate of Columbia University and I work as a healthcare consultant. Uh, but my side passion is that I serve on the board of trustees for a drug rehabilitation clinic. And right now, obviously in the current environment, there's a huge issue with opioids. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You know, you did a very good job in the beginning of the talk illustrating how patients are inclined to make decisions oftentimes that are contradictory to their own best interest for the sake of just feeling better or achieving a certain aim. 
And I'm wondering as a physician and as a public health professional, how do you uh, make that balance? How do you strike the right balance between having empathy and compassion for your patients, wanting to help them feel better, but also making an ethical decision about prescribing opioids in the current environment? Well, I don't practice, but I can tell you we're in, it's a, we're in a, a difficult situation now because there are people that do need pain meds that aren't getting the pain meds that they need because doctors are so worried about now feeding into the opioid epidemic. But again, I think a lot of this comes from knowing your patients. I mean, it's in a medical record. It's in, it's, you know, you read stories about people that have had a history of drug abuse and then they end up in the hospital and no one looked at their medical record. No one saw like this, this person cannot get these opioids. They've got a history of abuse. So we have that issue. And I think a lot of times it's in the medical record and we can go, we can look at it. And I, but I do think that we also have the other problem going on are people that are in pain and not getting the medications that we need. So we have the issues of rehab. And I think we have to make, there's, there's a lot of issues now with where we're criminalizing things where people need rehab in terms of like pregnant women that have been opioid addicts. And there are things that I think that we have to do a much better job in terms of rehab in our country. I think we have to do a much better job in terms of education with pain medication so that people get it that do need it. Um, and again, I think it comes from knowing your patients. It comes from not going in and out of clinics and see, seeing different people and people being too rushed to open up a medical record and see what's going on. I mean, <clears throat> I agree. I believe we should decriminalize addiction, so I should just be transparent about that bias. And I agree this is a public health challenge, not a criminal justice challenge. And you know, we know now, um, tragically, like the different demographics of our opioid epidemic in terms of how people got addicted. And so many people did get addicted um, because they were overprescribed in pain medicine. Um, you know, these horrible stories of patients be being given like 600 pills because they lived two hours away from the doctor's office and the doctor didn't want the burden of having to kind of ask the patient to continue to come back for regular checkups. Um, and we also know that many people, you know, kind of started uh, well-meaning to manage their pain on opioids and then kind of when opio prescription opioids were inefficient, you know, graduated themselves, I loathe that use of the verb, like graduated themselves into, into fentanyl or heroin or other kind of stronger drugs. And I think one of the challenges now is, I'm sure you know better than I do since you're on the front lines of this, is we don't have enough treatment capacity. So now a number of people I think courageously are coming forward and saying like, I need help and we don't have capacity to treat people. I mean, there are, you know, clinics around the country, and including here in New York State, that have waiting lists of six or nine months, right? That's just unconscionable to me that we're not able to help treat people who are asking for help. So I think we have to calibrate, which is a kind of medical decision, and I know it's something that Vivek Murtha, when he was our Surgeon General, was pushing kind of forward on, and I think unfortunately this hasn't really continued in the last couple of years, but try to calibrate, to Randy's point, like who really needs um, opioids, who could receive other types of pain medication, what is the right cadence for people to come back and kind of be checked up upon, and how do we really massively expand um, treatment capacity, and how do we also massively expand, which is something, you know, in total disclosure we've worked on at the Clinton Foundation, access to naloxone so that no one dies of an overdose, so that everyone hopefully has the chance to get into treatment. Okay. Oh, Samir. Yeah. We have another uh, online question. Um, uh, Casey actually is asking, in situations of wide sp widespread misinformation that lead to public health issues, such as the anti-vax movement, how can government action respect individual autonomy while protecting public health? You can both talk about this one. I mean, I think that's the whole debate in the School of Public Health is individual auton autonomy and where's the government step in. I do think when there's a danger to public health, it has to trump individual autonomy. I mean, go back to, you know, I, I was young enough to remember we never wore seat belts. And when seat belts laws first came out, we thought that was against our individual autonomy. So anytime there's this, anytime public health officials intrude on people's lives, because that's what public health officials do. We make you get vaccinated, we make you wear, wear seat belts. We don't let you smoke all over the place. So 
there's always a pushback, but I do think everything in life is this risk benefit analysis. And I think that when there's evidence to show that something is a danger, and there's, and again, we're talking danger to the public, not just danger to yourself, then, then, the, then we do have to step in to protect society because we do live in a society that needs, you know, same with vaccines. It's, you can think about it as people think, well, I'm just not gonna vaccinate my child, but your unvaccinated child is a hazard to all the other children around, especially when a whole group of children decide not to be vaccinated. You know, it took a while, but we finally proved through data that your smoking is a hazard to your baby or to other people sitting around you. So I think the more data, and it comes with data, it comes, you know, it's always a balance of how much we can intrude on people's lives and tell them, eat this, don't eat that. Um, but when it becomes not just a hazard to yourself, but to society around you, then I think, and that's the step that the government ha should come in. I mean, I agree. Um, I, I mean, I strongly agree. I, you know, publicly have said, and I'm happy to say again, and will continue to say, I do not support, you know, for public school purposes, personal non-medical exemptions. I just don't. Um, and I think if, someone is going to send their children to public school, there's a responsibility kind of to the social contract to ensure that your child is vaccinated to protect your child and other children around your child, particularly children who might be immunosuppressed or who are not able to be vaccinated for medically established reasons. Um, you know, I also think we're seeing this really interesting kind of fissure in what the big tech platforms are doing in that you know, Pinterest has banned like all anti-vax material from its platform. Um, YouTube on Friday night said they were demonetizing all the anti-vax videos, meaning they're no longer going to allow advertisement to run against them. They're not taking them down and there still are a huge proliferation of anti-vax videos on YouTube, but at least they're ensuring people will no longer be able to profit from like actively disseminating misinformation. Facebook says they're going to do something, but haven't done anything yet, which seems to be a theme for them, mm -hmm. um, particularly in this space. Uh, and so I think it's both about what the kind of government does at a state level, because this is very much a kind of state prerogative, and it breaks my heart in the midst of like multiple ongoing measles outbreaks in our country that Arizona might expand personal exemptions, but it is something the state legislature is actively considering right now. Um, so I think it's how do we put pressure on state governments to be good stewards of public health and the public health of children and families and those who really are vulnerable kind of when herd immunity breaks um, and also, what public pressure should we be applying to the big tech platforms? Because we know, kind of, you know, there are anti-vax groups on Facebook that have millions and millions of users and members. You know, there are anti-vax videos on YouTube that have been watched tens of millions of times. So it's not only kind of what should we expect and try to kind of positively influence from a like citizen government perspective, but what should we expect and positively try to influence from a citizen tech platform perspective. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Oh my gosh, in the back, because your hand's like so enthusiastic and high, and we haven't called anyone in the back row. I'm sorry, this is definitely not scientific. Thank it's you. like sort of this that. side of the room, oh, this side of the room, beginning, back. Uh, thank you both for the talk, and Randy, thank you for your book. Uh, it was recommended to me by your son, with whom I did jujitsu, and it was a great read, so everyone should read it. Um, <laughs> My question is somewhat related to what we've been talking about. I in hope particular. so. I really hope <laughs> so. Yes, uh, I, I've noticed. Uh, <laughs> since I've, I've known <laughs> the speaker since he was three, let's 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 stay on track here on the topic. Yeah. We shall. And um, you're on live stream, so it's not just the people in the room. Yeah, it's not just me. It's not just the family now. Hi. Um, I have recently acknowledged an increased popularity in the consumer market for health and wellness, and so I was wondering what both of you thought about brands like Goop, for instance, that just signed a deal with Netflix, or um, enterprises like Alex Jones's Infowars that sell a lot of uh, male enhancement nutrients or things like that. I wonder what you thought of those types of brands and their impact on uh, people's opinions about health and wellness and, and, um, and the future of well, that field. Well, maybe I'll let Randy talk about Goop and I'll talk about Alex Jones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, it drives me crazy. I mean, I think it just shows. You know, we talk about the 1920s, and we can laugh. We can laugh like, oh, my God, these people. You know, there was a book in the 1920s by a doctor saying um, that he could tell by just the look of you, your hormone balance. 1920s, we couldn't measure hormones yet. We actually hadn't even isolated certain hormones yet. But he could look at your face and give you the diet that you should be on. Famous people went to him, like the famous literate, like Hemingway knew him, like famous Famous, famous people knew this guy. Um, and we can laugh about that. No, the stuff that Goop comes out with, it drives me crazy. I mean, it drives me crazy when I see smart people doing stupid things. You know, if people don't realize that they're marketing something that might not make you feel that much better, I don't know. I think, I think if you see a website that has like an egg that you're supposed to shove up your vagina, and I'm not quite sure what it was supposed to do, but red flag, red flag. You know, roosters lay eggs, you shouldn't put one up. So um, that should be a red flag. And it, and it just annoys me. And sometimes like when I go to research this, like I think it's funny. And sometimes I, before I write about this stuff, I actually have to take a few days so that my writing isn't so angry because it's like, funny, not funny. So yeah, this stuff drives me crazy and they just keep on going and people love it. And people, I, I know, cause like people send me emails to say, oh, you'll be interested in this, like friends. And as soon as they send me that, I'm like, I know it's gonna be something that I'm not interested in. <laughs> and sure enough, it's like a cure. Like, I don't know, we have all these like cleansing things and stuff that don't need to be cleansed all the time. Um, so yeah, it drives me crazy, so that's, that's mine. Yeah, no, I think in some ways this is actually the perfect question to end on, even though I didn't know that um, you had known Randy since you were three and took jiu-jitsu with her son. Um, but Which I think, isn't true. <laughs> but I think, you know, we've talked a lot about communication this evening. I mean, Randy's talked a lot about um, kind of how ideas have gone viral even before kind of the internet with um, kind of the Steinac procedure and kind of talked about how sometimes ideas require enormous amounts of kind of pushing like our heroic um, hunter grad scientist. And you know, we've talked about how do we think about telemedicine and kind of what's still the medical importance of ensuring, you know, there is a doctor or, or kind of trusted um, nurse practitioner at the center of that. We've talked about how kind of doctors communicate population level data and in individual kind of patient settings. We've talked about kind of data that comes from other places and kind of whether that can be used, kind of how do doctors think about pain. I mean, we've talked so much about these questions really around communication, and yet I think it does kind of continue to come back to um, how, do we, how do we broadly as a society, you know, teach people to be kind of good and smart consumers for themselves and their children what should we expect and how should we then enforce those expectations and have real accountability for um, doctors and nurses to be kind of providers and purveyors of kind of that information, whatever the kind of commensurate treatments are. Um, and also then how do we ensure that other people are not included in those trusted relationships, whether they're, you know, I, I would say even well-meaning uh, celebrities or, or pretty malfeasant ones. And I would kind of, I think it's pretty important to distinguish, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow and Alex Jones here, um, because I have never had any reason to doubt that she is deeply sincere in what she believes kind of has worked for her and what she believes could work for others, even if it is totally untethered from any evidence base. I have no reason to believe there is any amount of good faith in Alex Jones. I think anyone who, leaving aside anything he's ever said about my family or President Obama or Democrats in our country or progressives in our country, anyone who has demonized the Sandy Hook families in the way that he has is a miserable human being. And the level of vitriol and bile and hate that he has animated toward those whose children were shot and murdered while they were in school, as well as the teachers and the principal who were trying to protect them, is just basically the definition of unconscionable to me. And yet it is interesting that a main profit source for him, 
kind of to the question has been actually is antifungal creams. That has been Alex Jones' real area of charlatan speciality. Are all the fungal creams that he has peddled on his radio show and on his website. And yet still, um, the people who have continued to listen to him, even after his like horribleness around the Sandy Hook tragedy, um, I think help illuminate this larger challenge that Randy really draws out in her book of people looking for certainty and looking to other authority figures in their life. Either people whose anger matches their anger, which I think is really Alex Jones' specialty, or whose beauty matches their ideal, which is probably Gwyneth Paltrow's specialty. And I think this is then a real challenge to all of us who chose to spend time here this evening together to talk about kind of these issues of how do we help people understand that while kind of the anger or the aspiration may make them feel good, maybe those aren't the people they should be asking for advice about kind of what they may be feeling on a given day, kind of what their test results may be, or kind of the idealized life through the health and wellness prism that they may be aspiring to. So I hope um, if you take nothing else away from this evening, you will take away that Randy is hilarious, <laughs> because she is. Oh, yay. Um, that she's brilliant. I'm not even saying this because her children are sitting in the front row. Um, <laughs> that she's brilliant because she is. Um, but also, we have a lot to learn from our past to try to help inoculate us from making the same mistakes in the future. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Just as a reminder, we have uh, Randy's books here for sale and she'll be signing them and we have a reception in the back and we welcome you all to join us and thank you again. <laughs>